See, it doesn't work. Oh, that's weird. It, well, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. Those, those numbers aren't exactly accurate. No, like that, that is exactly accurate. The bald guy in the compressor head videos told mm. me that that would be accurate when he told me to use variable length codes for my compression, that that would give me close to entropy. But what I have here is nonsense. Well, okay, hold on. This, okay, so the algorithm's fine. No, the, the algorithm's not fine. Your job is to teach people algorithms. And how are you still employed here? Because this is bad. This is ignorant. David Huffman would be turning in his grave right now. Ah, but you do know who David Huffman is. See, oh, my so job that's the is point. to do the, the point is to learn names, not to learn compression. You're just name dropping now. I thought you were going to teach people algorithms. I don't have time for bad ones. OK, OK. We're competing with cats on the internet. We don't have the full amount of time to go through to the algorithm. To tell the story, the final, the punchline, well, the thing that works. There's, there's a short, it's, we need to get everything into Every, one everything little. into one video that should be yes. complete and teach people how to do things because that's your job to teach, is it not? OK, so there's other parts of the algorithm that we didn't get a chance to do last the time. The people but in the camera need to know the whole algorithm. You need to tell them, tell them. OK, OK, so what do you want me to do? Tell them. I want you to go and do your job and tell them exactly how to succeed with compression. Fair enough. So. Oh, wait, no, your intro. Sorry, one little thing. The fear not young programmers thing, that's insulting. Young programmers aren't afraid. But that's my bit. It's your bit, it's wrong, it's insulting, it's mean. Fine. My name is Colt McCandless and this is Compressor Head. <laughs> You know, by now I think that we've all understood that variable length codes aren't exactly optimal. Consider if you wanted to compress all of the books in the English dictionary, uh, all 26 volumes. Uh, sure, we could just run through, create a VLC for the whole thing, and then compress it, but that's just not optimal. Uh, see, the single tome for words that start with Q would have generally more Qs in it than any of the other tomes combined. Uh, as such, the efficiency of codes used for the other books of A and Z would be offset by the abundance of Qs in the tome of Qs. Sounds like my new band. Anyhow, sure you could, with the right foreknowledge, simply compress 26 separate streams, but we can't assume that all data streams will be so well behaved. What we really need is a way to encode our data that takes locality into account. But it's almost impossible for us to pick those dividing points, uh, given the fact that we're taking the whole stream from a high-level view. The trick is this. We don't pick a split point ahead of time. Uh, instead, we use a dynamic method of encoding that lets us know when we should be splitting our stream appropriately. And this, my friends, is the definition of adaptive statistical compression. It's a crazy algorithm that lets your coding stream reset itself if things get too out of hand. So let's take a look. Break. Go. Now, typically, there are three stages to a statistical compressor. Number one, walk through the stream and calculate probabilities. Number two, assign variable length codes to symbols based on their probability. And then number three, walk back through the stream and output the appropriate code word for each symbol. It uh, basically means you have to do two passes through the stream and have one VLC table for the entire set of data. Now, the adaptive version of this collapses all three steps into a single one. The key to that functionality lies in the symbol to code word table not being set in stone as we're encoding. Instead, it updates itself as we encounter symbols. Uh, basically, it works like this. Read in a symbol, output its variable length code, and then update the VLC table. But uh, this is a little complex. Uh, let's try to look at an example. Let's say we've got a VLC table that looks just like this. Uh, now let's say we read in the next symbol from our input stream, which is a B. So we would then output the one zero value to our output stream, and we would need to then go and update our probabilities. Uh, the next symbol again is a B. So we once again output a one zero to the output stream, and we're gonna go ahead and update our probabilities one more time. Uh, so let's see, this goes to uh, 40 here, and this goes to 50 here, and uh, that one doesn't need to be used. Now, notice what happened here, though. Since B suddenly became the dominant symbol, it now should have the shortest code word. So this should go to one zero, this should go to zero, and this should stay at one one. Uh, 
Well, we got an extra sticky out of it. <laughs> so if the next symbol we read off the line was actually a B, zero would be output to our output stream rather than the one zero before. This allows our stream to dynamically update and reassign the shortest symbols to the most probable code words, even as the frequencies change in our encoding process. Now, the decoder will work in the opposite form. It reads the variable length code, checking each step against its current table. Uh, once it finds what it's looking for, it emits a symbol, updates the VLC table, and then continues on. Now, let's uh, look at that in action. So we say we've got this updated VLC table here. Let's get rid of these, we don't need those anymore. Let's say we've got this VLC table and we read in a one zero from our stream to decode. Of course, this then translates to emitting a B to our output stream and we need to, of course, update our probability since we've seen a new symbol. Uh, this goes to 40, this goes to 50 and this goes to 10 once again. And once again, B actually has become the most dominant symbol and we need to change our code words accordingly. So this should go here, this should go here, and this should go here. And look at that. As long as our decoder is updating its symbol table in the same fashion that the encoder is, the two will always be in sync. This is the basic process of how adaptive statistical coding works. The encoder and decoder are both dynamically updating their probability tables for symbols, which affects compression. This is a very simple idea in theory, but you need two other items to make it work right. Oh, no. That wasn't fair. But one caveat here is what happens when we encounter a symbol that we haven't seen before. There's effectively no entry in the VLC table for us to reference, so we can't directly emit a symbol. I mean, we could hypothetically update our table first, so then we could output a 1 1 to the output stream. But uh, this actually creates another whole problem too, because the decoder itself would get super confused. I mean, it would see the one one on the output stream and think it's two B symbols in a row since it hasn't been told to update the VLC tables. So we need some way to signal the decoder to add a new symbol to the stream before updating its table so we can stay in sync with the encoder. This can be done with the help of a new code that can be emitted to our stream. Anytime we encounter a new symbol, we output a literal code to the output followed by the 8-bit ASCII of our input symbol. Only after this point do we update the stats in our VLC table. But the lingering question is, what should we use for the value of literal? I mean, we can't just choose a random set of bits or anything that violates the prefix rule. Instead, what we have to do is initialize our VLC table with a fake symbol that represents literal. When we encounter a symbol from the token stream that we haven't seen before, we first output a VLC for the literal token, followed by the eight bits for the new symbol. And then just like normal, we have to go through and update our table and probabilities accordingly, reducing the probability of the literal symbol. The decoder, when it sees the literal token, will first read in the next eight bits and add the symbol to the table and update the probabilities accordingly. Effectively, this allows our encoder and decoder to handle adapting to new symbols that they haven't seen before. That's good. Ow, f dude. Now, as we've talked about before, as your adaptive stream adjusts to new symbols that are being added to it, the code word lengths will change and you'll eventually hit a point where the output stream is diverging from the suggested entropy by a specific amount. For example, let's take this phrase here. As we're encoding it, we can track the suggested entropy against the results of an adaptive VLC implementation. Now, in order to allow our stream to effectively split itself for a better compression, we need to allow it to define a point in which it can reset itself so that future sections can get better encoding. Now you can see that for this example string, we end up with the encoded output where each symbol is about 1.1 bits larger than the suggested entropy, resulting in a stream that's 26 bits larger than it should be. But the truth is that if we split the string in half and encode each one separately, we'd end up with a lower entropy and smaller encoded output, uh, which yields a stream that's only 22 bits larger than the suggested entropy stream.
To do this, we employ the same tactic that we had with the literals and create a reset token in our variable table. Anytime this symbol exists in the stream, it signals the encoder or decoder to reset its current VLC tables and start fresh, uh, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, however, the real trick then is knowing when to emit a reset token. See, as we're outputting code words, we can keep track of the suggested entropy of the input stream and the actual bits per symbol of the output stream. If the output size starts diverging from entropy by a significant amount, we can use this queue to emit a reset token, at which point the stream resets and starts fresh just like normal. Applying this technique for large streams is critical to ensure that you're staying as close as possible to entropy, even though the probability of the symbols will change as you process more symbols in the stream. I mean, this, I'm this sorry. is... <laughs> Well, that works. See? See, I told you. Listen, it was never about the algorithm. It was all about the data set. Uh, by taking advantage of the locality of our data, we're able to optimize the tables more efficiently, which means that we're going to get better compression. This is the whole point of a dynamic statistical. Wait, where, where, where are you going? I mean, we got to talk about the dynamic Huffman and dynamic arithmetic. Some of us have real work to do. Oh, well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for stopping by. Grow some hair. My name is Cole McCandless. Thanks for watching.